Welcome to Wake Up and Live with Christopher Flake. This is a daily podcast to encourage and inspire godly living. Let's join in and listen to today's message. Good morning. Thank you so much for tuning in as it's Friday and you're heading into the weekend. Thank you for taking the time to listen as we're continuing on looking at the the super eight, the great eight that we've been talking about, the really the what ifs of life and that if we, you know, we get past the if only regrets in our life because it's so important for what God wants to do for us. You know, I believe that consciously or subconsciously, most people are held hostage by one or two of the three mistakes in their past. And it's and if it's a secret sin, it feels like solitary confinement. I mean, we can get on with our lives, but we can't get past the past. Instead of living in the here and now, we're living back in the then and back there. I mean, we define ourselves by, why, by what we have done instead of defining ourselves by what Christ has done right. Or we define ourselves by the hurtful things done to us instead of what Christ has done for us. You know, in 1850, Nathaniel Hawthorne published this magnus opus, The Scarlet Leather. I mean, in the novel, this young woman, Heston Prine, is found guilty of adultery, and she is required to wear a scarlet A on her dress. I mean, the symbol of shame. We do the same thing, don't we? We get quick to label people by categorical mistakes that they've made or the one dimension of their identity. And I'm afraid that this is just true of the church as it is of culture. I mean, whether it's an A for adultery or D for divorce or G for gay. And that isn't how God sees us and labels us. He takes off our grave clothes of sin and clothes us with this garment of salvation. I mean, he gives us a new name, a new identity, and a new destiny. He puts a different A on us, apple of his eye. I mean, there's a storyline in John's gospel that is not unlike Hawthorne's Scarlet Letter. A woman is caught in the act of adultery. The religious mob is ready to stone her to death when Jesus steps up and steps in. I mean, Jesus doesn't defend her adultery, but he does defend this adulteress. I mean, his defense is pure brilliance. He who is without sin among you, let him throw the stone at her first. And then one by one, they drop their stones. They walk away until it's just Jesus and this woman. Then Jesus labels her F for forgiven and says, go and sin no more. And I can't help but wonder, would I have come to this woman's defense Or what if I have picked up a stone? Honestly, I don't know, but I'll tell you this. Whenever I hear about a high-profile failure, I try never to respond in a holier-than-thou fashion. The first thing that fires across my synapses is John Baffert's famous adage, But for the grace of God, there go I. I live by the maximum love people where they least expect it and least deserve it. I mean, that's how you can change someone's life forever. When the Pharisees were writing people off, Jesus was writing them in. When everyone else was showing them the door, Jesus was showing them grace. This woman walks off the pages of scripture, but not before Jesus totally changes her trajectory of grace and the catalyst that turns guilt into gratitude. One of the act of grace can turn the worst moment into a defining moment of someone's life. You can be that agent of grace. That is the moment for this woman. It turns her greatest if only regret into a wonderful what if possibility. Go and sin no more. You know, God got Israel out of Egypt in one day, but it took 40 years to get Egypt out of Israel. It happened in a place called Gelga, 380 miles north of Egypt. The Israelites, like the slaves, acted like slaves. After all, it's tough to break the cycle after 400 years of slavery. I mean, technically, the Israelites were set free at the Exodus. Practically, it took them 40 years to fulfill this exorcism of their demons, and it wasn't until really that they had reached Gilgah that they had finally left the past in the past. God said, today I've rolled away the shame of your slavery in Egypt. You know, sometimes it takes 40 long years to bring closure to the feelings of condemnation. 
Sometimes you have to travel 381 miles just to get past out of your present, right? But no matter how long it has been or how far you have traveled, God can still roll away your if only regrets. It's never too late to be the one who you might have been. And you know, we'll talk about that later, but I tell you what, you need to get to the path to the promised land, the what if promised land that we must go through Gilga. I mean, if you are in Christ, you are no longer defined by what you've done wrong. You are defined by what Christ has done right. You are a new creation, but sometimes it takes some of the time for your new nature to become second nature. God can deliver you in one day, but it may take years to break old habits and build new habits. And for the record, the key to one is the other. If you want to break the sin habit, you better establish a prayer habit. I mean, Jesus came to put the past in its place, the past. We just need to leave it there. I mean, if you want to leave the past in the past, it helps if you bury it, burn it, flush it, or delete it. Isn't that what Christ has done with us and with our sin? He crucified our sin by nailing it to a cross. Don't resurrect it. You know, every word in the first verse of the Super 8 is significant, but the word that be may be the most overlooked is now. You know, full forgiveness is our present tense reality, right here, right now. And it's not just a theory that Paul is floating here. I mean, how many times must Paul, who was once known as Saul, had the sinful flashbacks to Stephen stoning or the countless other Christians he hunted down like animals? Paul was an eyewitness, which means those snapshots were seared into his visual cortex. When he closed his eyes, those images could have haunted him for the rest of his life. By today's standards, Saul was a terrorist. Then he had an encounter with Christ that blinded him. He regained his physical sight after three days, but the grace of God enabled him to turn a blind eye to sin forever. If God turns a blind eye to confess sin, shouldn't we? That doesn't mean that we deny our sin or ignore it. If you underestimate your sinfulness, you depreciate the grace of God. Paul called himself a chief of sinners. He freely admit that he was the worst of sinners, and perhaps that's why he's a, he appreciated the, the grace of God the most. The reason many of us lave others by their sin is because it makes us feel better about ourselves. We may be sinners, but at least we don't have we haven't done this or that other thing. But Paul is explicit. All have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. There is no gra gradation to it. There's no no better than thou attitude. We are either in sin or in Christ. We're either guilty or forgiven. We're either sinners or saints. Even after this, his conversion, Paul could have allowed sinful memories to hold him hostage. Residual feelings of condemnation could have kept him from going on to in his missionary journeys, kept him from preaching the gospel, kept him from writing half of the New Testament. But Paul knew that his sin was nailed to the cross and that the hammer of God's mercy has no claw. Before you step into what if, you have to get past of if only. I mean, the crossroads is the cross of Christ. It's the cross that turns the if only regrets into the what if possibilities that God has for us. You see at Calvary's cross, Jesus broke the chains, broke the curse, and broke the code. It's history's greatest accomplishment, but sometimes we shortchange it. My sin debt is paid in full and I'm fully forgiven, but that's only half the gospel, the glass half empty gospel. We tend to focus on the penalty being paid, which is wonderful beyond words, but the righteousness of Christ has been credited to your account. So the glass isn't half empty, it's full of the righteousness of Christ. This half empty mindset causes us to focus on forgiveness, but Jesus didn't die on the cross just to forgive you. His aim is much higher than that. He died to change you. He didn't die on the cross to, just to keep you safe. He died to make you dangerous, a threat to the enemy. He died that to, so that you could make a difference for all eternity. Let me change the metaphors and paint a picture here. You know, just this week, my very first basketball coach has passed away. 
And I was I, starting around second grade. I started playing basketball. I was this tiny, skinny little guy. And this coach, he would take me. I was left-handed. There wasn't a lot of left-handed people around during the day. And, and he took me and he taught me how to play this game of basketball. He encouraged me. And he said, because of the way that you are, because you're left-handed, you have certain abilities and certain things that can be used to see greatness. And he would just pop me full of this encouragement and he would tell me of all the things that I could do not that I couldn't do and because of him he called me lefty O'Doul and he really changed the outlook that I had in life it isn't that exactly what the Heavenly Father does with our game right all the turnovers are deleted and every missed shot is edited out and it, it doesn't show up on any video it doesn't show up in any box score but it's been edited by the author and perfecter of our faith and that's what this coach did. He would take anything I was doing, he would make it a positive. He would make me look the best. And when you're confessing, I mean, really God is editing. And it's just not our sin that is edited out. It's his righteousness that is edited in. What is left is a human highlight reel that would make Sports Center proud. So what if you started acting like the agent of grace, looking for opportunities to love people when they least expected it and least deserved it? Wouldn't that be great? Wouldn't that be great? awesome if today that's what you said you were going to do? You were going to look at people in a totally different way. You were going to see them greater than maybe what they are. But you would open up this heart of grace and you would begin to love those people that others have rejected. You would begin to set your heart on fire for those who may seem lost. Because I tell you, when you begin to see that, the if regrets, the if only regrets begin to disappear and the what if possibilities begin to act out in your life. So again today, thank you for listening. Wake up and live empowered, blessed and loved so that God can do some amazing things in your life. You know, I want to tell you, every next Friday, starting next Friday, I've got some great news. We're gonna, I'm going to be breaking this up. I think I told you that we're going to, I'm going to try to have some great new teachers on the, on the podcast. And starting next Friday, teaching Faye Styles is going to be teaching. The, we'll be doing the teaching you'll be hearing here every Friday. So check that out next Friday. And also, um, Man Up and Live is going to be starting Saturday, this Saturday. You can check out all the Man Up and Live uh, on the and on the website called manupandlive.podbean.com. All the messages are going to be there. I may put some here on Saturday so you can get a feel from it for us. Guys, it's time that we man up. And so there's going to be some great teaching for guys to really take a hold of where God wants to place us. So God bless you today. Have an amazing weekend. Make sure you tune in on Sunday as we continue on in our series of Free at Last, really for God to set us free from the things that hold us and keep us down. God bless. We'll talk to you soon. Thank you for listening to today's podcast. I hope that you were encouraged and inspired. Join Christopher each day on Wake Up and Live. You can find all his messages at www.wakeupandlive.life. May the Lord bless you and keep you.